So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks for this uh, very nice introduction. So thank you so much. So this is going to be an exciting talk, um, not only for you, but also for me, because uh, I did last minute preparations. But um, it is a topic uh, I've been worked on, I have been working on for quite a long time, uh, on, on RNA sequencing and deep sequencing uh, and functional genomics. And, um, and this is a material which I took from a tutorial which I gave a while back, but it's still current material, I think. OK, so uh, we have 45 minutes, so uh, not too much time. Um, I give you some very basics of sequencing. You probably heard some of it, but I give you a little bit of historic, uh, historic uh, perspective. I give you some RNA-seq basics, some chip-seq chip basics, and maybe some ideas on integration. So I guess it's a bit more biological than maybe the others, but I think I would like to explain to you uh, what these sequencing, what deep sequencing can give you and what it cannot give you. So, so you can actually, when you build a model, if you do the right statistics, uh, what, what are the assumptions and what, are, what, what do you need to know about the, uh, the data, right? And uh, please interrupt me anytime. So, I mean, we have tons of time, I guess, uh, so and you just ask. This is most important that, that you understand it. Okay, good. So, I think there's a, there's a good history uh, of quantitation, um, quantitative biology. So biology has a rich tradition in quantitative analyses. Uh, but then in molecular biology, everything kind of went back to a more qualitative analysis that uh, this single gene is doing exactly this. And uh, so there's a more, it went from the quantitative studies to more qualitative studies uh, in the 1980s. So when we, um, yeah, we, we cloned this gene and uh, then we got, uh, this kind of phenotype where we had uh, this kind of relationship to another gene which was more qualitative. And I think we are in the field now where this becomes more quantitative, uh, where we have more quantitative measurements. And this is where deep sequencing can really help us. Okay, I mean, you have seen this before. So we go from, from the DNA, uh, there's the transcription um, to the RNA and from the RNA to the translation. Uh, via translation to the protein, and from the protein, by interaction of these proteins, uh, we see some higher level phenotypes, okay? So, and um, transcription is tightly regulated as a part of that uh, development, as part of development, uh, so it's maybe easier to measure than the protein levels. And the critical questions are, um, which genes are turned on and off in a given uh, cell at a, a given time? What is the expression level of these genes and how is it all encoded in, in the regulatory program on the DNA, right? So, and this is something which we need to understand in order to understand later uh, the impact of a variant which is on the genome to the higher level phenotype. But as you will see, it's quite a way uh, up there. Okay, so, so th this is roughly the structure of a gene. So you have, I'm not sure you can see this. Uh, so this is the gene. It has axons and introns, and this is uh, typically what is transcribed. And then there's regulatory parts, uh, the cis regulatory part, and there's uh, a long range regulatory parts like enhancers and so on. Okay, so, and typically uh, biology has been considered, uh, has been looking at uh, understanding uh, these different, um, the, the genes and, and exactly the, the architecture of these genes and the regulatory program. So I guess to understand uh, the structure of the gene, one first needs to sequence the genomes. And this is what I think uh, maybe from 1980 to 2000 really happened for the human genome. So there were some technical advances to sequence a single genome, and this was a human genome. So then I, I guess people understood, yeah, I guess actually you have to do a bit more. And uh, sequencing one genome is not uh, really enough. So and then is when this ENCODE project started. Uh, this is uh, the encyclopedia of DNA elements. This is, uh, once you have the genome, you would like to know where on that genome uh, you have regulatory elements. Where is everything sitting uh, so you actually know maybe um, where variation plays a role. So and, uh, in 2003, um, NHGRI um, started to think about um, and made a decision on funding um, improved sequencing technologies to not only um, sequence genomes, but also to uh, functionally ca categorize uh, pieces of the genome. So in 2004, there was the first part, the, the pilot project, the ENCODE 1%, one, uh, 1 then ENCODE uh, with the whole genome, and then Drosophila and mouse and so on. And let me tell you a little bit about uh, these kind of efforts. So the idea is that 
This is the chromatin. This is a piece of the chromosome. This is highly packed. And uh, when you unpack it, you see, um, um, you see uh, again, it's uh, wound around uh, some, some other um, proteins. And uh, here are regions between these packed elements which are accessible uh, to uh, the proteins which read off uh, the DNA. Okay? So, so everything which is highly packed is not so much accessible. What, what is accessible, that is uh, what can be translated and what can be, which can be acted on. Okay? And these are the sites which we find interesting because this is where something can happen. Okay? So typically people um, looked at uh, using microarrays for doing this. So, but uh, people realize when you can sequence genomes, genomes are long, you can actually use the same technology not only to sequence a genome, but you can actually uh, use this technology to profile what's happening on the genome. So where is something bound, where is something transcribed, where is something open, and, and so on. And a whole kind of industry of uh, different uh, technologies developed to characterize not only what the sequence of the genome is, but also what happens on that genome, right? So what, how is it packed and where is something binding? And essentially um, in 2003, NHGRI committed to, to these next generation sequencing techniques. And initially uh, the goal was a $100,000 genome, $100,000 genome. Uh, then the goal was a $1,000 genomes. This is today. We can sequence genomes for, for $1,000. These techniques are so efficient now that we can use them really for doing all sorts of other things. Okay, so maybe here's a brief uh, overview of different techniques. It's not quite up to date, but um, so there's something which is called Solid, uh, then Illumina, then Rush, and, and Pack Bio, and there's a few others by now, and they have different characteristics. Some can sequence long reads, and some can sequence more reads, and, and there's different characteristics. So the most common one and probably 80% of the market or more is Illumina, uh, and most of the genome sequencing or all functional sequencing is done by Illumina. And this is uh, maybe just uh, the explosion of uh, the amount of data you can get out of a sequencing machine, and I stopped this curve here in 2011. It's, uh, it's continued growing, and um, Roughly the characteristics are the same, so we get uh, reads which are about 150 nucleotides long. The number of reads got larger and the cost got a little bit lower. So, and, but roughly it's, it's, yeah, it's about uh, two times 150 nucleotide reads which we get and, and one library is something like 600 to $1,200, but you get maybe more reads now than you did get in 2011. Okay, let me tell you a little bit more about this. So, or maybe let's, let's uh, put an overview on this first. So, so on the one side, you might want to do a more global analysis. And this is what uh, maybe you have to sequence a genome. You might sequence multiple genomes. So you can actually compare genomes. You do something like comparative genomics. So then you can try to characterize maybe an organism in general. Uh, you, you might want to find where are the genes, what are the transcripts, what are the encoded um, proteins, and, and so on. So for this, you need to uh, sequence maybe the, the, the transcript home of a few cells from that organism, and then you have a set of transcripts. Or you can maybe try to find out something about transcriptional regulation. Or you can get uh, more specific, uh, then you can go maybe um, in specific tissues, or you can look for interactions, and you can really try to understand the, transcript, um, the transcriptional regulation. And maybe you can go into a specific individual and try to understand a single variant, what kind of influence a single variant on the genome has on the gene expression for one gene, right? So, or on a specific phenotype of that uh, organism. So, and um, what we need here is long reads because we would like to assemble the genome. What we need here is uh, shorter reads, but many of them um, because we need to count something. Here we would like to have something quantitative, uh, quantitatively measured. Okay. Any questions uh, so far? It's maybe it's trivial, um, but let me get there. Okay. So now, um, what we can use um, the sequencing technology for is not only uh, to sequence the genomes, but we can do the counting. And uh, the question is how 
what do you count? And there's a lot of uh, biochemist, uh, biochemical preparations you can, you can prepare a library with. So and there's something which is called chromat chromatin immunoprecipitation, mRNA extraction, metal sensitive uh, DNA preparation, or, um, or other, other ways. And um, I will describe two techniques. One is called ChIP-seq, and the other one is RNA-seq. And you've heard about RNA-seq quite a bit, um, and maybe I make it a bit shorter, and we still have uh, some, some work on ChIP-seq. OK, so I think it's important to keep in mind what uh, the goal is, uh, and to, to understand what kind of technique we use and what kind of analyses are necessary um, uh, for this type of data. So let's say you're interested in sequencing a genome. Obviously, you just have to sequence the DNA, and then you do something like assembly. If you're interested in a genomic variation, you need to sequence the DNA, you need maybe to assemble it, and then align, and then detect um, uh, different genomic variants. Or you can sequence the DNA, align it to the DNA of a reference genome, and then detect differences uh, and find uh, variants. If you're interested in finding new genes or transcripts, obviously you need to sequence the RNA, then you can assemble it, um, and then you know what the RNA is. Or you can sequence the RNA, align it to the DNA, and then detect uh, what um, transcripts might be. You could be, and this is all qual quantitative. So, um, let me see. Yeah, this is qualitative. You could also go from, um, uh, you might also be interested in gene expression or transcript expression, and this is more quantitative. You sequence the RNA, you align to known RNAs and then count, or you sequence the RNA, align to the DNA, and then count uh, the gene expression. And then there's more complex, uh, complex techniques like RNA protein binding assays, uh, which I will tell you more about later. Okay, good. So I guess uh, in the previous talks, you probably have seen this uh, many times, but um, the idea is uh, in RNA-seq that you have a pool of RNAs and um, that you select a subset of the RNAs, for instance, all those which have a poly A tail, which are processed in a certain way, then you fragment uh, these RNAs in a certain way, and then you align, uh, then you sequence, and then you align it to the genome, okay? So and in the end, based on these quantities, you would like to know what is uh, the fraction of RNAs uh, which were originally in the pool of RNAs. In ChIP-seq, it's different. You, you decide on a specific protein, and you would like to know where the protein is binding to the DNA. And that's the first decision. So then you do a, um, you cross-link that protein to the DNA, and then you have two um, ways to process uh, the, uh, the, the, the sample. One is uh, where you uh, take the protein, you have an antibody against this protein, you can pull out pieces where the uh, DNA is bound by the protein, and then um, you follow this protocol and find out where the protein has been bound on the DNA. And then you do the same kind of protocol where you don't have this uh, antibody, you st still pull out something and you align it against the genome. Okay? And then essentially you compare the profile from this one and this background distribution uh, with each other and uh, find out where there's an enrichment of uh, these fragments. I, I'll tell you more later. So generally, well, overall, there's different uh, stages in which you do the analysis. Uh, the first stage is more like the mapping stage. Um, you have either contiguous reads, so it's a little piece which m matches directly to the genome, or you have spliced reads which go from exon to exon, and there's a gap in between, so it's a bit more complicated. Then you need to um, aggregate and identify pieces. For instance, uh, in terms of RNA-seq, you might want to identify where's an axon, where's a gene, where's, a, where's uh, the beginning and the end of a gene. In terms of uh, ChIP-seq, it might be interesting to look at binding, where is a binding site, and so on. In the next step, you could uh, find um, maybe motives, you find, uh, might uh, determine the expression levels, you might look at differential expression, you might find new genes, and, and so on. And eventually you would like to integrate uh, these different uh, pieces with each other and build a joint model or at least have a joint analysis of these uh, data sources. Okay, so this is clear? Yes? Okay. Okay. 
OK, so when you think about RNA-seq, um, it's actually important to understand what's actually happening there. So, and this is what I'm trying to get at in the next few slides. Um, so I guess you have talked about RNA-seq, and I don't know whether, you uh, whether it was mentioned that there's different types of RNAs uh, which you might be interested in. So there's um, all the messenger RNAs, which have a, a cap and a poly A tail at the end. So and most RNA sequ sequencing uh, actually targets those and only tries to find and sequence these messenger RNAs. But there's a whole set of other RNAs out there. And it turns out that 98% or something of all RNAs is actually not messenger RNAs. They are ribosomal RNAs. They are piece of uh, this whole uh, uh, transcription and translation uh, machinery which is needed. And if you just sequence all RNAs, you just mostly get these ribosomal RNAs. But there's many other types of RNAs in there. And they have different length characteristics. They have different um, cappings and, and modifications at the end. Uh, they have uh, different structures and so on. And when you decide on what kind of transcripts or what, what you're actually interested in, um, you should decide what kind of RNAs you actually need uh, and find out. Because you can't change this later. And you can't sequence everything because you get a lot of junk which you're not interested in. Okay. Maybe not junk, but at least things which you know are there, but it's not interesting for you at this stage. So I guess just saying RNA-seq is maybe not enough. Uh, so you have to say RNA-seq on, on what? So maybe RNA-seq on messenger RNAs, or RNA-seq on polyadenylated fraction of the RNA. And these are the genes maybe uh, which you're interested in uh, in order to understand protein expression, for instance. OK? So the analysis of the biological sample really starts with a sample or library preparation. Uh, and if you don't do this, maybe you don't see what you want to see because it might not be there in your data. So and it's also important to understand, um, once you decided, let's say, you're interested in uh, the protein coding genes. So maybe you have to understand what uh, the details are to get there um, because as I mentioned, we have the ribosomal RNAs, or the tRNAs, and they constitute more than 90% of the, of the gene, of, of the RNAs. So what uh, the biochemist is typically doing is trying to get rid of the RNAs so you can actually sequence what you're actually interested in sequencing. But sometimes it works better, and in some case, uh, some, uh, sometimes this removing of the RNAs doesn't work as well. So you get artifacts in your data which are related to the, effic of the e efficacy of removing these RNAs where you get artifacts which are related to the process of digesting these RNAs, OK? So you might choose to ignore it, but actually this matters a lot when you, when you look into RNA-seq uh, analyses. So you find artifacts which come from um, rem removal of RNAs. Um, you have other um, preparation techniques, and they all have, leave a certain trace in the data which uh, distort your RNA-seq data a bit, at least. And um, maybe it wouldn't matter if it uh, is always the same, done in the same way, but it's typically not. If you do the same protocol today and tomorrow, or a different person, you get variability between these protocols, and you find variability which you have to model in, in your approaches. So something like batch effects and, and other things you really have to take into account. Otherwise, you find a lot of variability unexplained. OK. So let's say um, everything worked well. Uh, um, the biologist has done the RNA-seq uh, library preparation. Things went on through the sequencer. And then at the end, uh, you get uh, your reads. And now what? So the first thing you could do is you can just um, um, take these reads and assemble them uh, into uh, maybe a longer sequence. And if you have long reads and you've done it well, you get a, maybe a piece of genome uh, back. Typically, it's not that easy. So we're interested more in RNA. So it's uh, typically the genome is known. Um, let's say this is the genome, and this is our RNA. And we have to find these reads back in the genome. Okay. And uh, this is what's called alignment uh, or mapping. So the difficulty here is not necessarily that it's complicated, but it's more like uh, it takes long. So, and uh, it's more a, 
an engineering problem at this stage, I would say, to find uh, for all of the reads, uh, all the uh, places in the genome, um, and in the end count where are they. So just to give you an example, right? So when you look into a single sample, um, we might have hundreds of millions of reads of short length, which you have to find in the genome. Uh, and then you have a long map uh, where all the reads are, and then you have to count. So, and processing this is, yeah, really a computational challenge or an infrastructure challenge. You need uh, hard, uh, fast hard disks to, to access the data. You need uh, to have reasonably fast compute uh, to do this uh, for millions and billions of reads. So we have done a pro, pro, um, project where we have maybe 5,000 samples. Each sample has maybe 200 million reads, and this is about um, maybe 100 terabytes. And just reading the data once uh, takes days. So, so, I mean, this is something to consider when you do larger scale projects, which in the end you need to do in order to do an association study, right? So uh, you need thousands of samples. So here's some uh, mapping tools which people have used. Um, essentially, it's, it's solving that problem, but I don't want to go into detail here. Um, maybe here's just one idea uh, how, how this can be done better. Um, you can build an index data structure for such kind of sequences. And then uh, you essentially have a big table for every single k-mare which you find in the genome. You can uh, see when you have a read, where in the genome do I find this k-mare? It's a big table. It's a lookup table. And then you can see, OK, maybe part of that read maps here. And then there's extensions to this where you have spaced seeds, uh, which makes it arbitrarily complicated. Um, and there's a whole industry out there de generating new data structures uh, based on boros wheeler transform, for instance, which is very efficient, um, uh, and, and others. OK, good. So now let's say we have aligned the reads. Um, somebody gave you some, something which is called a BAM file. You know where the read aligns against genome. OK, what's the next step? So we have the reads. We have the alignments. And now let's say we can just count uh, how many reads do we have in one gene. So uh, this would be the first test. Uh, the first uh, summary statistics. And maybe if you have two different conditions or multiple different conditions, you could ask, OK, where is there a significant difference between two counts in condition A of that gene with condition B of that gene, right? The alternative is uh, you might directly assemble these genes, uh, these reads. Then you get something like transcripts. You can quantify these transcripts. And then you can do some analysis, some significance testing. Or you do something like uh, in the middle, you align the reads, and then you look at, OK, where is there maybe an axon? Because here is a bump uh, of reads uh, maybe in, in one position. And uh, from this, you can identify transcripts and then quantify. So these are some common analysis steps uh, of RNA-seq data. So now gene expression. Gene expression, I mean, you have You've probably received uh, big matrices with gene expression values before, right? So, but I, I would like to point out maybe some uh, concepts and some problems. So maybe you haven't thought about yet, hopefully, or maybe you have. Um, so the idea is very simple. Uh, we just uh, use the number of reads mapping to a gene as an estimate for the gene expression. OK, that's easy. So if you get. Um, Let's say we align 100 million reads. And for this one gene, uh, we have 1,000 reads. So it's 1,000 um, out of the 100 million reads uh, comes from this gene. So this tells us something about the gene expression. Obviously, uh, the number of reads scales with uh, the number of reads I sequence. And it also scales with the, number, with the length of the, gene, of the gene. A longer gene means we get more reads. Right? If you sequence more reads, obviously, we get also more reads. So that's why uh, there's uh, simple normalization, which I don't think you should do. But that's, I, I guess, what everybody, or what many people is doing. Um, they take the read count, which we measure, and we divide it by the length of the transcript in kilobases, and uh, divide it by the number of reads which were sequenced in total. And this is what's called the FPKM or uh, RPKM, um, which is the reads per kilobase of transcript per million map reads. 
Obviously, there's uh, some issues, right? Uh, let's say you have the ribosomal RNAs in your sample and you didn't remove them very well. This contributes to the number of reads which you have sequenced. So it's in the denominator, right? So, uh, but it doesn't contribute to the expression of the gene of most of the genes. So therefore, it looks like the gene expression of your gene got lower because you couldn't remove most of the ribosomal RNAs. Make sense? So I guess it's important to understand that this normalization, which you probably has been done for you by somebody, already contains mistakes or contains uh, errors, uh, which uh, you should know about. And this is only because of the normalization. So, okay, here's again uh, the idea. Um, the RPKM values strongly depend on the expression of the highest uh, genes, uh, and this would be, for instance, the ribosomal RNAs. Um, and you have to better normalize it. Then there is also an effect of uh, genomic variation. Let's say this is your gene, exon, intron, uh, intron, exon, and so on, right? This is, would be your RNA-C coverage. Uh, if you had a normal, let's say, reference genome, you count the number of reads for this one and say 1,000. And now let's say in, in a different individual, there's a deletion in the genome and this piece is missing, okay? Obviously you get fewer reads, but is it different gene expression? I don't think so because essentially the gene has the same height here, it's the same expression level, just some piece of the genome is missing and hence we get fewer reads. So you have to think about uh, whether this really means differential gene expression Maybe it does, but it depends really on your question. So I would say if you're thinking about uh, trying to understand um, uh, gene expression regulation, probably not, because that influences only the expression level, which is here. Yes? What's the exact definition of a read? Uh, a read is just a, um, a short, short sequence, maybe of 100 nucleotide length, 100 nucleotides length, so 100 letters. And uh, that is a small fragment which was generated in this biochemical process uh, along the way. And they are randomly sampled from um, the RNAs, from the RNA sequences di directly, or from the DNA. So why are longer sequences more common? <coughs> so longer is better, mostly for the reason that uh, you can more accurately uh, align these reads. Um, because let's say you have only a 20 nucleotide sequence. It matches typically to more than one places, sometimes to thousands of places. So, and with um, 150 nucleotide, or maybe let's say with 100 nucleotides, you can map about 90% uh, of the reads uniquely. So, with 150, maybe 95 or something. So, but uh, to get it to 100%, you really have to have really, really long reads. Okay? More questions? Okay, good. So, and sometimes uh, you have, I don't know whether you see this region here, so this is gray. Here's another gray region. So let's say you have two different versions of that gene and they differ maybe in this little bit here at the end. And maybe um, in a different individual, they, the gene is expressed in the same way except uh, the, the, the ratio of these two transcripts, these two versions is slightly different. So do you call this differential gene expression? To think about, right? So. And ways to attack this is maybe to, ex to remove the regions which contain these variabilities, um, maybe also remove this region and don't, don't use it for counting. So maybe more, uh, more tricky is uh, when you don't have a deletion, but uh, you have, let's say, a mismatch. So you have a SNP in this position. Then the reads in this position don't map so well because there's a mismatch because of this exact mapping strategy which is often used. So for some reason, the coverage goes down here because you have a SNP here. So if you're interested in QTL analysis, which associate, associates gene expression with SNP presence or not, right? Then the position or the SNP itself uh, is a confounder to the gene expression because it changes uh, the gene expression value, but this is nothing to do with uh, gene regulation, but it's only a confounding factor because you can't align the reads in this position. Okay, does it make sense? Good. 
Okay, so this is a, uh, yeah, I guess that's the point. Um, you can have a, you can have a snip or you can have a deletion and uh, then there's more sophisticated techniques which can align these reads to the genome not only by exact mapping but also by taking these single nucleotide variants or deletions into account during the mapping. And this way uh, it removes uh, these confounders or it reduces uh, these confounding factors. So there's some, some aligners which uh, take let's say all known SNPs or all known deletions into account while aligning these reads. And this helps reducing it. And here's the other point again. Let's say you have two transcripts uh, in a long transcript and a short transcript. Um, and in one condition, this one is 90% expressed and this one is 10% expressed. And another condition, this one is 10% and this is 90% expressed. If you just count the number of reads, it looks like the gene is really differential expressed because you get fewer reads for this condition than for this condition. But it is not really differential gene expression, it's just differential transcript expression. So, uh, and, and to, one has to understand what this means. So biologically, this is very different uh, from differential gene expression because that happens at the beginning of the gene and, and the other stuff happens maybe where at this position where something happens. Questions? Good. Yes? Um, so when we now say we take all the known SNPs into account, but now we want to do an EQTL and we want to find a new SNP which is somewhat uh, related, then this confounder would still be in uh, the read counts because we couldn't have taken care of it if it was not known. I, I, I see what you're saying, so, um, and, and it's kind of true, but uh, I guess it's easy to make a catalog of SNPs first uh, and assume it's more or less correct, which might not be com complete, but um, let's say the common SNPs you probably know, right? Uh, and if you take into account the common SNPs into the mapping, that's probably okay. If you have rare SNPs, it might still influence it, but uh, yeah, then it just becomes more complicated. <laughs> I, I don't have a solution to it here, so. You can do that, um, and essentially you can align the reads, and whenever you find evidence of more than one read having exactly, exactly that deletion, then you can include it. And, uh, but there's a sensitivity specificity trade-off, so I mean, you introduce a lot of variants which might not be true. In the end, um, let's say this is an area of active research and it's not entirely clear what to do, so <laughs> yeah. Okay, now let's assume you have aligned your reads, you know where, where to count, um, and uh, you can, in principle, um, estimate your gene expression by, let's say, just uh, looking at regions of the genome uh, which are always expressed. So let's say you have two different transcripts. Or maybe, maybe let me explain this here. So. One way to measure gene expression for this case here is only to look at the regions which are shared among all the transcripts. Okay, so if you measure gene expression here, it's relatively safe. Um, if you share also the same promoter region. So, but people argue maybe it's not enough uh, and maybe you would like to look at the transcript expression. Okay, so let's say you have two possible transcripts. This is uh, depicted here. This is a little, it's what's called a splicing graph. Every path through this uh, splicing graph is a possible transcript. And this is uh, the read coverage uh, which in this case has been simulated in log, in log counts. And both transcripts here have a read coverage of 10 on average. So and I guess what you see maybe is um, here it's a little bit lower than the rest, right? Essentially what you have to do is you have to fit um, these, uh, the coverage to constant pieces which correspond to this exons or this exon combination. Essentially, it can be written down as a little optimization problem, right? So you have something like the read coverage, which you observe, and you have a linear combination of transcripts times a weight. This is like the mask of where an exon is. This is the weight for the transcript, and you have a linear combination of this. And you would like to have that linear combination close to the observed read coverage, and you like to minimize over all possible 
combinations of these transcripts. Okay, so it's. I mean, this is the squared error. Um, it's it's not the best for this case, but it's uh, easy to understand. So essentially, these are these pieces here, and you would like to estimate the abundance of the two transcripts such that the red lines roughly match on these segments the black line. Yeah, there's different uh, ways to do this. Uh, you could use uh, not the squared error, you could use a Poisson uh, distribution or a log likelihood of that. Um, there you could use absolute differences or you use a negative polynomial distri distribution for fitting these kind of um, um, distributions. So then I guess the next idea would be to not only take uh, the gene expression, but to take uh, the transcript expression as the phenotype, right? So, so we know what the transcript expression is. But it's important to take, uh, keep in mind that this is only an estimate. And the variance of that estimate is tricky. Because maybe you have two G uh, transcripts which are very similar. The variance for that estimate is going to be very high. And typically, we try to avoid it to have something as a phenotype which is the outcome of an optimization. Ideally, we can we would like to have a phenotype which directly measures, maybe by counting, what, uh, let's say, the expression of that transcript is. So for instance, in this case, we could count, for instance, how many reads go from here to here, and compare this with how many reads are in this area. Okay, This is just based on counting. Uh, it doesn't need any inference. It doesn't need any optimization. And that's a better phenotype. Uh, maybe that ratio, or, I mean, so there's some, some things to be considered, right? So I d I'm not very exact here, but I uh, just want to make you aware that uh, taking the outcome of such an optimization problem is not the best uh, to do. So the solution might not be stable, and uh, it might not be unambiguously solved, and, and the read coverage is also not constant over the transcript, and, and so on. So there's a few issues here. And I would like to point out, um, um, I glanced over the choice of the aligner, but actually that's one of the most important choices you do. So let's say you align your reads with tool A, uh, and you align your reads with tool B, and then you run another tool on top of it, uh, for instance, for quantification or for transcript reconstruction or something. It turns out that the results are quite different. So, uh, so the alignment step is surprisingly important uh, for doing any kind of analysis on top of it. Maybe it's not too surprising to you, but uh, I guess for the community, it was really surprising when we did this kind of analysis. So here's uh, maybe different aligners, um, which we did in some comparison. And uh, then there's different filtering criteria applied to these alignments. And this is the accuracy of um, reconstructing um, a set of transcripts from these RNA-seq data. Okay, and you see it's, I mean, if you happen to use um, uh, blood, in this case, it's probably not the best idea if you happen to use, um, uh, which one is that? Uh, this was top hat in this case, and I think the other one is, is star. Uh, then it actually worked pretty well for transcript uh, quantifications. Okay? So as an implication, um, you should understand if you take an alignment uh, which comes from person A who did the alignment uh, and co try to compare it with the uh, alignment uh, or quantifications which come from a BAM file which is done by another person, these are not necessarily comparable. So typically, you would first need to align them in the same ways, using the same parameter settings, using the same platform, everything. Then you can quantify. Otherwise, you just introduce new batch effects. Okay? And typically, what, this is what, what needs to be done, and this is what, what is a lot of work. OK, good. So, um, so I've described uh, the uh, read mapping, maybe, um, maybe transcript identification, some expression levels, differential expression I haven't explained, um, but, but it's more or less straightforward. So um, get to at least the basics of, uh, of ChIP-seq. So, I, I, um, so this is the DNA. Um, and this is uh, the histone, and the DNA is wrapped around these histones. 
And when it's wrapped around the histone, it's kind of inactive and it's harder to access for other proteins. So, and typically the active parts of the genome, are maybe the enhancers or promoters, they lie between these histones. Okay, and uh, this is uh, the RNA polymerase. It sits on uh, that promoter and it interacts with enhancers as well, right? And to understand how this thing works, uh, you need to understand where enhancers and where uh, these promoter elements are. And where, for instance, that transcription factor uh, here is. So typically the transcription factor has a little tag and this tag can be recognized by an antibody. And um, you can fish out these uh, antibodies um, later. Essentially the ChIP-seq experiment works like this. Um, you, take the, you take this kind of, uh, as uh, maybe the machinery as it works, you uh, cut the DNA randomly into pieces, and then you fix uh, the proteins to the DNA, and there's a chemical which cross-links it, so it makes it uh, fixed, and then you have an antibody uh, which uh, pulls on some of these epitopes, which can fish out specific transcription factors or specific things which sit on DNA. And here you see, this is the antibody, you pull it out, all the rest goes away, and then you see essentially uh, this piece of DNA we can sequence. Okay, this is uh, roughly the chip seek. And here it is uh, in more detail. So there's uh, many different versions of this. Uh, what I explained is uh, chip seek. Uh, this is for a specific transcription factor. You find out where the transcription factor binds on the DNA in this specific uh, cellular context where you look at. So there's something related to that which is called a DNA seq. DNA seq um, is like you don't need to look at one specific transcription factor, you look at all transcription factors at once and you ask where is that chromatin open? So where is actually space so actually could something could sit there, right? And uh, this is a chemical which is called DNAs. Uh, it's digesting DNA and can only digest the DNA if um, it's not protected by these histones. So, and then there's, so this needs millions of cells, um, and then there's new versions of this, ataxic and uh, MNAs and FairSeq, and they, uh, some of these uh, only need 50,000 cells. You can actually do something on very small amounts. And this is, I guess, roughly the difference, and these are the developments in the last few years. Maybe this was 2008 or something, this is uh, 2016 or 15 here, right? Um, the data roughly looks the same. So you get maybe at a, yeah, you can work with fewer cells and can be done on two more samples and, and so on. Okay, so here's an example. Um, so typically what you get is, is a peak like this. So this is a piece of genome. Every single dot here is one read which maps to this region of the genome. And if you, this is a transcription, this is chip seek against um, um, one protein, which I don't know which one, um, maybe NRSF, uh, and it identifies a binding in one specific exon of, of a gene. And what you see is there's a big peak with many reads in this location. Okay? So, and when you look at multiple of those cases and try to identify what, what makes it bind there, you see uh, that this motif always is near that position here. Okay, so and essentially by looking at the top, I don't know, 100 or 1,000 uh, positions where you find the such peak, you can do motive finding and you find uh, something like this. So this is a particularly nice case, right? So why is that important? Um, it's, let's assume you're interested in, in something like uh, a QTL, right? And you find a SNP which is here and a SNP which is here, which you can't distinguish because they are linked. Which one would you choose, right? So, I mean, I find it quite easy. You would choose this one, which lies in, in some area where there's a binding site. So this is, I think, what, what this data is most useful for. So you do large collections of binding assays. You know where these proteins bind. And then when you uh, do your association studies, you look into the regions and, let's say, use it in, in a clever way. 
Maybe I shorten uh, the middle part here and just come to to that end. Um, maybe how you could use it. So let's say you do a QTL. Um, you could ignore all that functional uh, data and uh, just for now, you do the QTL, you get a list of SNPs where, let's say, uh, this variant is, exp uh, is correlated with gene expression of a specific gene. Then you have that list, and then in the second step, you use it as a validation. If you find the SNP, which is in a functional region, which you found before, then this probably means something. So it's more like, yeah, that makes sense, right? So, and um, so maybe, maybe that's not the best way, but it's, it's a way which has been done. So to show that these uh, associations make sense and to show that these annotations make sense. What you could also do is you could uh, just use it as a filtering technique. So you look at all the uh, variants, um, well, yeah, all the variants which have a functional annotation, so which are overlapping with some binding site, with some motive, some way uh, where you can say, okay, probably it makes sense. If, if a SNP would be here, I could explain why it is here, right? So use it as a filtering and all the other variants I just remove and don't look at it. So and then I perform my QTL. I have increased power because I got rid of 90% of these SNPs. I need a smaller sample size. So that's why this technique is probably good if you have a small sample size or if you have rare variants, um, which you would like to understand. So I call the first one a posteriori, the uh, second one a priori, and maybe the, the third one, I didn't have a good name for it, uh, let's, call, let's call it in situ. Uh, so if we do it during the inference, um, so I think one important bit is to understand not only that there is a functional annotation, but maybe that a certain type of functional annotation has something to do with the effect. So let's say the transcription factor binding of one specific transcription factor is affected by a certain SNP, by, the, um, by what you're interested in. So we could learn a weighting for different annotation types and then while, while performing the associations. So essentially we um, do this filter in a somewhat adaptive way. So we say something which we know has an effect we keep in as an annotation and something which we have never seen as an effect we remove. And this has been uh, proposed by Joe Pickrell recently. Okay. Um, so I skipped quite a bit here. Let me just uh, go to one piece I, I would like to mention, uh, maybe if I have a few minutes. So we do a chip seek, and one track of chip seek is the binding of one specific uh, protein, one transcription factor, and so on. Now, there's, there's a few hundred transcription factors out there, and um, you can obviously measure them all, and this is what ENCODE uh, tries to do. So for a large number of transcription factors, you, you can find out where they bind. But you can't do this on your typical uh, genome. I mean, if I sequence my genome, I probably cannot, cannot do chip seek on every tissue on every uh, protein. So it's just too much, right? So, um, but uh, for ENCODE, they, they have done it. Uh, and essentially, you get uh, a large number of tracks here. And uh, what you will find is that they all correlate a lot, right? So, I mean, it's not, they're not completely independently binding. So then what people do then is um, they, they segment these um, regions. So maybe they find, okay, in this uh, region, there's a certain com combination of um, transcription factors binding, and we call this segment type A. And there's another combination where there's another combination of transcription factors binding is combination B, and in the end you just need to um, give a region a certain state, a transcriptional state or chromatin state. And this is something which you can then use in order to inform uh, subsequent analyses. So you don't really need uh, the full um, uh, array of transcription factor chip seek experiments. You can probably infer the chromatin state also with a small number of uh, transcription factor uh, chip seek experiments. Or you probably can even go from one uh, organism or from one individual to another and assume probably it's the same combination of uh, states at this location. Okay, does it make sense? Yeah? 
So I think I'm, I'm essentially at the end here. Um, so, um, okay, yeah, maybe acknowledgements. Um, so this was a tutorial which I gave a long time ago uh, with um, Ari Mot uh, um, Motasavi, um, and uh, there was help from quite a few people in my lab. Um, and there's uh, maybe another piece of news I would like to share. Um, this is uh, the current view when I go to work, uh, so in, in New York. Uh, I live on this little island here and, and work is like uh, somewhere behind this building. And soon, I guess, uh, the, the work will look slightly different. Uh, and uh, I'm going to move to this place, uh, which I don't say where it is, but uh, you'll find out soon. But <clears throat> so we, what's not changing is the type of work which we're doing. We do machine learning for um, phenotyping from medical records. We are interested in cancer, we're interested in large-scale genomics and decision support systems and gene regulation. And if you um, are interested, uh, or when you're looking for opportunities, maybe come to me and talk to me. Okay, thank you.